You're listening to the Lead On Podcast, where we discuss experiences in the armed forces while exploring lessons from military leaders. Hey, good morning. Welcome to another edition of Lead On, Lessons from Military Leaders. I'm David Deary, president of the Enlisted Leadership Foundation, where we're building America's leaders. Today, joining me is Matthew Roeder. Matthew's an Air Force veteran. Matthew, good morning. Good morning, David. It's good to see you. Hey, good to see you. Great, great to uh, have you in the studio, which is really our, our individual places of business. Uh, but it's great, great to have you here. So tell, tell us, Matthew, a little bit about your, yourself and, and uh, time you served in the Air Force. So, so you did uh, about eight years and recently transitioned out? I did. I did nine years on active duty and then I did two years in the National Guard, actually. Uh, so 11 total. Um, though, as we all know, that doesn't count for a full 11 years of service at the National Guard time. But uh, yeah, commissioned uh, out of the Air Force Academy and uh, was a TACP officer, Tactical Air Control Party. And I came in um, kind of at the really the very beginning of that career field in the Air Force and uh, spent my entire career doing that. Um, it was a fantastic experience, had a, a, just a lot of great uh, mentors and leaders that were above me. Um, and got to kind of watch really the inception of that. And so it was, it was pretty fun. That's fantastic. Well, again, thank you for your service, uh, whether it's uh, 11 years, two years, nine years, National Guard, Active Reserve, you're part of the 1% that, that actually raised your right hand and willing to give your life for our country. So thank you for that. So in those uh, 11 years of service, I'm sure um, you know, as, as leaders, we give a lot of advice and early on in our career, we receive a lot of advice. So I'm, I'm always curious of, uh, what's the worst piece of leadership advice someone ever gave Matthew Roeder? Man, that's a, that's a great question. And, uh, maybe, a, maybe a tough one. Cause I tend to block the specifics out of my mind, but, uh, as I was thinking about it, I think, um, probably the worst advice that I was ever given um, really kind of revolved around um, basically ostracizing myself from my troops. So basically it was, it was the idea of maintaining this really strict divide um, in, hey, you're, you're an officer and you're airmen. Um, you know, you need to make sure that you put up barriers and don't, and really it was centered around kind of not getting to know your airmen. And so um, that was, thankfully squashed out of necessity early on in my career. But uh, but that was definitely kind of given and the expectation um, from one of my first commanders was, was there'd be this really distinct uh, officer enlisted divide. And, and by nature, there is some of that, but, uh, but I was thankful to have um, senior enlisted leaders who were able to kind of articulate, I think more clearly, maybe what the intent of that was. Yeah, that, that's really interesting uh, when, when you say it came from one of your senior commanders, you know, especially and, and we're going back, obviously, a dozen years or so. Mm -hmm. But, you know, today, fast forward a little bit and I read a lot of articles, I hear podcasts, a lot of conversations around culture, command culture, business culture, just the environment in which people work and that directly can impact the culture. It'd be, it, it would be interesting to go back and see you explore what what's the culture like of an organization that has such a distinct separations uh, between your your senior leaders and and the troopers that are that are on the deck plates as we say in the navy um you know so so in the tac p world did you work with uh mostly officers or mostly enlisted um or you know a, a you know split between the two yeah, we we mo work mostly with uh, with our enlisted force as officers, and coming out of a service academy that was really unique for me, and so um, definitely a unique experience coming out of there. Where where in the service academy world, that's very much the inverse, right? And so um, coming out of that into an almost exclusively enlisted uh, career field at the time, well. When I came in, literally, I was I was the only TACP officer that most of them had ever seen. So we'd have I'd have guys that, as a brand new lieutenant, they'd walk in the office and kind of poke their head around the door, and they'd say, "Oh, cool," and then they'd walk away. It's kind of like I was a, a zoo animal uh, yeah, right? sitting Unicorn. back there. Yeah, exactly. And so um, 
so that for me was was just really unique and i had to I, when i when we go on training uh tdys or anything like that i was almost always the the only officer on those trips and uh very often and so um really quickly you know you had to learn how to um maintain appropriate distinctions without um kind of blurring blurring the lines too much but also be i mean they're part of your team and it's a it's a team culture vice and officer enlisted culture well sure and, and it requires a lar- large amount of self-discipline but humility as well mm-hmm. um you know we at the enlisted leadership foundation we we teach what we call relational leadership you know you can always have a blank leadership everybody likes to put a title around the leadership right um but but when you you as leaders you have to build trust and and how can you build trust if you as the senior person especially to have some humility to open yourself up and, and share who you are if you're not going to we can't expect in my experience i can't expect the junior troopers uh, to come to me and share who they are with me, their senior person, um, because they don't know or trust me. So I, 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 I found out kind of like you with that advice, like, yeah, I'm not sure. And then you got thrust in this job where you're, boy, if you would have po- followed that advice and you had, you were the only officer, boy, you'd be, you'd be on an island, right? And no establishing trust. So, you know, how, um, how would you recommend somebody? you know, balancing the humility uh, and maintaining, uh, obviously, that senior subordinate relationship, but yet um, approaching that line without crossing it. Mm-hmm. That's a that's a really tough thing to do, for sure. Um, it's a tough thing to, to have that line and establish it. One of the things that was really helpful for me uh, early on, especially, was having um, senior non-commissioned officers that were around me that helped establish those lines really clearly. Um, and, and for me, getting to know, um, getting to know everybody on a, you know, on a first name basis, like I know, I know your name, I know, um, your family and and asking good questions. I wasn't great at that early on. Um, I think I've grown in that a lot over the years. Um, but really having, uh, me being willing to, to be vulnerable um, and to be an expert so that so you garner that respect that um, that is kind of inherent to the position. Uh, just because that position's there and the, the respect is inherent to it doesn't mean that it's automatically associated um, from your subordinates. And so, um, so it really just required a lot of really hard work, um, making sure that, that you're working hard, that you're taken care of and listening well. Um, to those around you. Um, and then the respect's going to come. It's going to come naturally, right? Sometimes it's, it's mandated simply by a position and by relationships. Um, but, but that mandated respect um, can really quickly and easily transition to um, earned respect when, uh, when you're taking care of the people around you and, and showing humility and vulnerability. Um, yeah, you know, it's, um, it's so important. It, it that the earned respect, I, I love how you have you phrased it that way. I, um, in the Navy, when we promote from E6 to E7, the, the new person who's promoting going through an initiation season receives what we call a charge book. <clears throat> in the charge book, they go around to other Navy chiefs, senior chiefs, mass chiefs, and uh, you receive charges, you know, words of, uh, of um, not encouragement as, more, as much as, Here's some things that help me be successful that can help you be successful as a, as a Navy chief. Um, I've kind of learned over the years, you know, although you uh, only 20 percent of the Navy E6s make chief. So 80 percent will never receive a charge book. But that doesn't preclude us from engaging and having these conversations like you and I are having. Uh, many of those have their own uh, individual you know, charge books, notebooks, whatever. But, you know, I, I tell people you'll be the be the person others want to follow because of who you are, not because of what you wear, right? They, they know that yeah. we got to follow because of our position authority. Um, but I want to follow you because of how you wear that uniform and, the, and mm. how you, you serve. That's um, good. Matthew, so your time in the Air Force, you also got to spend some time in the Army or with the Army going to Ranger, Ranger School. Mm. Tell us about that experience. 
Yeah. So, so getting to go to Ranger school, um, I think we were, uh, we were just kind of telling a story about, or you, you were asking last time we talked about kind of a funny story and, um, and something that I've told, uh, this, that people seem to get a kick out of that I've told a lot recently. Uh, there's one day we were, we were laying, we were post one mission and, you know, we had gotten our hour of sleep or so, um, we're laying there in the mud waiting for, uh, for trucks to take us to our next Michigan, mi- next mission. We were up in the mountains in uh, Dahlonega, Georgia. So it was pretty chilly, but uh, we were laying there patiently waiting. Um, not always very patiently, but this time it was kind of patient. And uh, we, I look out in front of me and sure enough, by this tree, there's, there's a hot dog that's laying. And this is not a hallucination. This is, um, those happen. <laughs> First thing I thought. Those of. happen uh, pretty frequently. Uh, but this was not, this was a real hot dog. And so I looked at my ranger buddy. I said, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to go get this hot dog. And so, you know, look around, there's no instructors. And I low crawled over there, grabbed the hot dog, brought it back real fast and, uh, dusted, dusted the, the dirt and the soot off of there. And, uh, I ended up splitting this hot dog four ways. And, um, so myself, I got a quarter, my ranger buddy got a quarter and then two guys next to us, uh, all got a little piece of this hot dog. And it was probably one of the best hot dogs I've ever had in my life. Um, I don't know how it ended up there. I suspect that, you know, the, the ranger instructors, the RIs were camping there the night before enjoying some real food. And, uh, and, you know, that one fell in the fire and it was, it was, you know, trash to them. So they just threw it out in the woods, but it ended up being quite a treasure, quite a treasure for us. That gives a new, uh, new definition to the five second rule. That's right. Uh, yeah. So, uh, that great story. Thank, thanks for sharing that experience. So, so nine years uh, in the Air Force, a couple more years after that, the National Guard, and then you decided to, to hang up that uniform and transition out of the military. Um, so, so through that transition, uh, how'd that go, and what do you do now? Yeah, so the transition, um, you know, it, it went really well. It it was kind of uh, precipitated mostly just by starting to have kids, and so um, I've got three three little ones and one on the way, and. Um, having them around, it was, uh, just kind of time. I think my wife and I decided that, um, that it was time to, to maybe transition out and, um, do something where I wasn't gone quite as often. And, uh, and so we were able to move back to my hometown in, in Texas and, um, move about three miles away from the, uh, from the ready, the ready babysitters in their grandparents. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so. Been there, done that. Yeah, so it's been, uh, it was, uh, it was a good transition. And I mean, it's, I would say it's still going on, right? And so, um, originally did the soft transition, so to speak, and went over to the guard and, um, and then now just, just recently fully separated from the guard. And, uh, it's been, it's been really interesting and a lot of fun to kind of take this experience that I got to have, um, in the Air Force and, transition a lot of those lessons learned into the civilian world and into kind of uh, corporate America, so to speak. Um, I do not work for a corporation. I work for really small uh, kind of family office type company. Um, and, and we work in specifically in the life insurance space, um, mostly doing wealth transfer. Um, but it's still been fun kind of on that side of, of just doing the business building. And I always joke that I went from maybe the largest corporation in the world in the department of defense um in the most robust and to uh to maybe the the smallest type and least structured type of organization and so um it's been fun bringing a lot of those just leadership lessons and um things into that world yeah so you know so uh, again keeping with you know an idea of humility and you, you mm-hmm. touched upon that multiple times so you know as a, as a humble leader or servant leader um in the life insurance world it's you know, it's something that, on one hand, in the military, as a, as an officer, humbling yourself to engage with the enlisted, um, but in corporate America, uh, especially in sales, uh, there's you you have to maintain that humility be, as you engage and try to bring on more clients. Correct? Absolutely, um, and, and I think people that I've gotten to work with, I think, really appreciate that humility as mm-hmm. well. And, and it's really it's all of, it's all the same basic principles, whether you, you learn it in the military or on the, on the civilian side. And, you know, I could, I could go back to lessons that I learned as a, um, you know, as kind of the first of my kind officer in a new career field to working as a, um, in a joint environment, most often 
um, with the army or with the navy, um, and even in the deployed, especially in the deployed environment, um, or just just using kind of some of those uh, those lessons of that, and then transitioning those those lessons of humility, and you know, it's the things like just uh, kind of showing up on time, working hard, being a hard worker, uh, being willing to uh, to volunteer for the tasks that people don't always want to do and just doing it with a good attitude and um and then being authentic too you know it is you know we talked a little bit about about ranger school and being an air force guy and in, in the you know in ranger school and an army course um i got asked pretty often like oh do they you know do they haze you or do they hate on you because you're in the air force and i said honestly not really um, cause as long as you're doing your job, like nobody cares in that environment when things are hard and there's a job that needs to be done. Nobody cares, you know, whether you're wearing a, a yellow uniform or a green uniform or a blue uniform, um, it just doesn't matter. They, they want you to get the job done. It's so true. And even in the financial industry, you know, and selling life insurance, uh, uh, or any kind of wealth management. I mean, there, people have options. There, there's so, such competition, if you will. However, there's more people that need the service than there are service providers. So, so, so you're never at a loss, I'm sure, for clients. Um, and, and so what, what, what might separate uh, someone like me going to your organization versus a, a competitor could be that humility or even that, that veteran uh, bond that you and I both share, um, that, which I, I would think uh, would help you in, in the line of business that, that you're in. Um, you know, in, in the final couple minutes that we have left, uh, you know, I've experienced the, you know, we'll just talk life insurance for just a second as you transition out. I talked to transitioning military, uh, whether it's four years or 40 years. And, and um, how, in your experience, how valuable is it? How important is it? I, I think that life insurance is probably one of the o- overlooked um, items that we consider obtaining, maybe because we're young, we think it's not something that's needed till you're 50 or more. Um, and when you transition out of the military, I don't think people even take into account the service group life insurance, the SGLI that we all pay our $35, $40 a month. I, I understand it's going to go up. Um, but is that something that you you talk about to, to your clients that are military? Absolutely. Yeah. That's just... Yeah, like you said, it's kind of something that's really overlooked. And the way that we like to position it um, kind of in our firm and, and the way that we usually present it is um, look at it as sort of an asset class that is uh, that's uncorrelated and that hedges mortality versus hedging um, any sort of uh, market forces, really. And so whether that's a term policy for, uh, you know, the, the cheapest you can get for whatever you need just to cover to provide a death benefit. Um, for your family and to protect your family, or if it's doing something more on the, you know, estate uh, creation uh, versus estate preservation uh, realm. So if you're looking to build some sort of um, asset, uh, you know, if it's um, a really, you know, high net worth, ultra high net worth client who's looking to um, provide liquidity at death, like both of those things, they, it's the same, it's the same way to look at it, right? It's a, it's an asset that um, instead of hedging, market forces you're hedging your mortality and that's something that the life insurance company uh, by nature because that's what they study that's what they do better than um than anybody else and so that's a just an easy i think a kind of simple way for people to conceptualize it you're not just throwing money away for something that maybe you don't need but it's something that is really important to help protect your family to help provide liquidity um and it and it's a it's an asset that works in conjunction with the rest of of your uh of your assets. Well, you know, when they say along with taxes, the only other guarantee in life is death. That's right. So, so somebody's going to take advantage of it. And what I learned is um, even when you're young, it's not like you're purchasing a life insurance to uh, take care of your family so they never have to work again or anything. It's, it's really getting through those uh, first couple of years, pay for education, get out of debt, uh, maybe retraining if you know for a spouse things like that so good I, I appreciate you you sharing that it's just something that I, I do believe that people really need to pay attention to and add add as part of their portfolio along with the 401k or a thrift savings plan and, and so on and so forth 
So, so Matthew, um, before we close up, you know, I opened up, uh, asked that question, the worst piece of leadership advice. I also like to, I, I'm curious, you know, as a leader, we, we make decisions, we make decisions on the fly. And uh, sometimes we make these decisions without a whole lot of information. Um, ever, ever make a, a decision that kind of uh, went sideways, but you lucked out and it ended up okay? Yeah. Um, I think the, the one that I, there are a couple different things that I was thinking about with this question, but the one that I think, um, really it's still, it still kind of bothers me. And so that I thought I'd bring it up is, um, I had an NCO that was kind of a trouble NCO anyway. And we had, uh, been given him, uh, or had given him feedback, midterm feedback and whatnot. And he was about to, um, he was about to move on and, and go to his next assignment and we were having it going away and that ended up getting scheduled and <clears throat> there's a, a million factors, right. That contributed to this, but, uh, but ultimately it got scheduled and I wasn't able to, to go to his going away party. Um, and, and I felt terrible about it cause I just, I just double booked and, and it was something that I felt like, you know, I'd given this guy negative feedback and, um, and, and then wasn't able to support him in that, um, on his way out. And so that just, uh, it sounds really simple, but it's, it, frankly, it still kind of bothers me to this day. I don't like the way that, uh, that that ended up. And so, um, yeah, that's a definitely a leadership mistake that, um, that I think ultimately, you know, there's, it's probably water under the bridge to him. Uh, he, he's a, you know, he's a professional and does his job. And so, um, and, and so, you know, that's something that maybe to him isn't a big deal, but to me, it certainly was. So. Yeah, something you took. It sounds like you took away, and 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 you won't uh, make that same mistake twice, which yeah. is what we want for any mistakes, right? right? Don't want to make the same mistake twice. That's right. I'm David Deary with the uh, Listed Leadership Foundation. You've been listening to Matthew Roeder, uh, Air Force officer and, and National Guard, uh, at another episode of Lead On: Lessons from Military Leaders. Uh, we drop the first and the fifteenth military paydays every month. You can learn more about the Enlisted Leadership Foundation by visiting our website, www.enlistedleadershipfoundation.org or elf365.org. Uh, Matthew, any final words? No, David, I really appreciate you having me on and, and letting me uh, share some leadership lessons and relive the glory days. Well, th thank you for taking the time, Matthew. Thank you again for your service and what you continue to do with our veterans. Thank you. Thank you, uh, listeners. Again, David Deary, the Enlisted Leadership Foundation. This has been another episode of Lead On, Lessons from Military Leaders.